We couldn't have asked for a nicer, more beautiful Christmas morning, amen? The sun is shining, the air is crisp and cool, and, and God is in his heaven, and all is right on the earth, in this place. A man went to the doctor one time, and, and uh, he said, Doctor, I think I'm dying. The doctor said, what's wrong? And he said, no matter where I touch, it hurts. Everywhere I touch, it hurts. I think I'm going to die. <clears throat> the doctor looked at him and said, well, I have good news and bad news. <clears throat> the good news is you're not going to die. The bad news is your finger is broken. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Dickens wrote, at this time of year we think of Christmas Carol, <clears throat> but he wrote another book. If you had to suffer through it in high school or college, it was called A Tale of Two Cities. It wasn't a very big book. But it starts out with a very famous line. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Some of you have read it, I see. <clears throat> that could have been said. Those words, the best of times or the worst of times, could have been said about the time when Jesus was born. <clears throat> when Jesus was born, Judea, where he was born, was a state-owned province of Rome. Rome, all the known world at that time, was under Rome's authority. And the heavy hand of the Roman boot was upon the neck of the people of Judea. Caesar Augustus was the emperor, but he had installed Herod as the king over this particular area of land. And during this time, people had to work hard to make a living because the taxation by the Roman Empire was so great that almost half of everything that they earned had to be given to Rome. Poverty was everywhere and sickness was not uncommon. What was uncommon was justice in this part of the world. To make it worse, for the people of Israel, <clears throat> they had not heard anything at all. No prophet had spoken. God had not uttered a sound for 400 years. It was like God departed. Now, some of you have gone through some spiritual dry spells. <laughs> but 400 years is a long spiritual dry spell. But that was the situation on the ground in Judea when Jesus was born. For many, they were saying, where is this Messiah? Where is God? When is God going to send this Messiah to save us? <clears throat> For many, it was the worst of times. But there were a few stargazers in Persia who were studying the heavens and saw it differently. They began to see an alignment of planets making something akin to a bright star appear, and it was something they had never seen before in all of their stargazing. For them, it was an omen. It was a good omen, a good sign that somewhere in the world was the birth of a world leader. For them, it was the best of times. I think Mary would agree with that. Mary, the mother of Jesus, would have agreed with that. You see, that first Christmas day was the best of times. <clears throat> After Mary went through the events of that first Christmas day, it says in Luke 2.19 that she was filled with wonder. The text says this, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
For just a minute, I want you to put yourself back in Mary's place again. It had been an unbelievable nine months. She had a lot to think about. A lot of things had happened in her life. Her life literally had been turned upside down. Perhaps she even reflected to the beginning of the story nine months earlier than that. Let's look at it. It's in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. <clears throat> and I'm going to do something different today. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And we're going to read this together. I think on Christmas Day it would be a great time to read this story together. So let's go. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. You may be seated. Thank you. Save my voice. Yeah. <laughs> when Mary arrived at Elizabeth's house, Elizabeth was six months pregnant. Mary stayed for three months. 
No doubt she stayed until John the Baptist was born and then she returned to her home again to continue her pregnancy until the time that she would be delivered. I have two points today of this sermon. The title is Touching God with Praise. And my point number one is the first time we should touch God with praise is in the good times. We should give God praise in the good times. When the news came to Mary about being chosen, she was amazed at the wonder of it all. The angel said that, that she was highly favored. I think immediately she saw what a great privilege this was to her to be selected to be the one to carry this long-awaited 400 years, this long-awaited Messiah. I suspect that she could have been, that she knew that she could have been just one more nameless, faceless peasant girl from some obscure village. But she doesn't congratulate herself. She doesn't pat herself on the back and say, look, I must be somebody special because God has chosen me. Instead, she celebrates God. She reaches out to God and she touches Him with praise. She touches God with praise. <clears throat> She sees that this is clearly a remarkable thing that's taking place in her body. He's about, God is about to change the course of human history. The most important three decades in all of time are about to begin. Literally, it's a time that splits time. When we, when we measure time, we measure it before Christ or Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, from Jesus' birth forward. And so she realized the significance of this event that was taking place. Where is God? Where is God in all of this? Well, God isn't busy doing great, miraculous things out there. God is spending his time with two obscure women, one of whom is barren and is not able to, to bear a child at all. The other, a young virgin. You, you read it together. It's Mary's song is what that's called. Sometimes it's referred to as the Magnificat. But it is the song that Mary sang when the angel left her. And her response is powerful. She sings out a song of worship. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. The word glorifies, or sometimes it's translated as magnify, <clears throat> is a powerful word. It denotes mammoth expressions of exaltation to God. It is a mega exaltation. And then she says, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She uses a word that means overjoyed. A joy that, that, that spills out of your life. It's that unspeakable joy that we sang about a few minutes ago. And it's, it's almost too difficult to express it. And while she communicates great things about God's character, I want to note one particular thing that she said in here. She said, God is a saving God. You see, you don't have to beg and plead with God the way that some people begged and pleaded with God's in their day. God is a saving God by nature. And he reaches out to his people who are in need. People who are in the worst of times. So my second point. The second time that we should touch God with praise. Is in the bad times. <clears throat> when the news came to Mary about being chosen. She had to wonder how this sequence of events was going to affect her. <clears throat> it, was, it was good times to be selected by the Lord, but it, but it meant that she was going to pay a heavy cost. Here she was, a virgin, sexually innocent. She's about to have a child out of wedlock. And 
she's got to go to her fiancé. And can you imagine how she puts the words together? She's got to go to her fiancé and tell her that I've never been with a man, but I'm pregnant. <laughs> what would you say if you were that fiancé? Yeah, right. If you were Joseph, would you have believed it? Probably not. So here we have a disappointed and a confused fiancé. Things weren't going so great. Besides that, it's going to be real obvious in a little bit of time that she's pregnant. And everybody in the small village where she lives, everybody knew everybody. Have you ever lived in a place like that where everybody knew everybody? There's no way that you could keep a pregnancy secret. But eventually Joseph gets it right and he decides to take Mary as his wife. But now, to make an emotionally difficult pregnancy worse, he has to make a trip to Bethlehem because of the silly census that's taking place. The timing couldn't have been worse. And when they finally make it to Bethlehem, there's no place for them to stay. And then the contractions begin. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you, perhaps, have had contractions begin in a very unpleasant time in your life or a particularly unpleasant circumstance. It seems like I recall, Gail, that you mentioned something about having pregnancy, having, having contractions and almost delivering in a pickup truck or something like that. Tow truck. Tow truck and a tow truck. Okay, you have to ask her to tell you that story later. The baby's on its way. What are you going to do? The only place they could find to give birth to this baby was a stable where the cattle and where the horses were tended to. Now, if you were in this situation, what kind of attitude would you have? Mary touches God with her praise. You see, Mary is a true worshiper of God. How do you know when someone's a true worshiper of God? It's because if, if you're a true worshiper of God, it means that you go through life regardless of the circumstances with continuous joy and complete contentment regardless of the circumstances. It says Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And there was a lot to ponder. There was plenty to be content about. You see, she had the satisfaction of knowing that her willingness to be available, to be used by God, and to be obedient were worthwhile, even if it meant going through some hard times. So, there's really only one way to respond to our set of circumstances. Whether they're good circumstances, whether they're bad circumstances, <clears throat> whether they're good times or bad times, we need to touch God with our praise. You see, today more than ever, is a time for worship. For the true spirit of Christmas is all about worship. I have to tell you, when I'm standing there playing that guitar and I look up and I see the look on your face and the joy in your face as you worship God, it gets me. That's what Christmas is all about. It's not all about presents. It's not about food. But it's about giving God the glory, touching God with our praise. <clears throat> Christmas is worship. The shepherds came to worship Jesus. The wise men came, okay, we know it was a couple of years later, but the wise men came to worship Jesus. Christmas is about worship. Gordon Dahl said this, in our culture, we tend to worship our work, 
work in our play and play in our worship. Let me read that again. In our culture, we tend to worship our work, work in our play, and play in our worship. How true those words are for so many, especially during this time of year. But this isn't a time to play. <clears throat> it's a time for worship, for there's good news all around us. You see, the distance between man and God has been bridged by Jesus Christ. Now, that distance isn't something that God created. That distance that we have with God is man's own doing. But God has bridged the gap just like he promised he would. And that, my brothers and sisters, is worthy of worship. We have the opportunity to celebrate because God is a promise keeper. His very nature is a nature of keeping his promise. If he says it, he will do it. And you don't have to wonder if it's going to happen. If he says it, he will do it. For some of you, life is pretty sweet right now. You're on the top of your game. You're on the top of your world. For others, life isn't so easy. It's hard. It's bittersweet. It's painful. It's difficult. For others, it's even worse. As bad as it is for us, you don't have to travel very far in this world to find folks who have less than you. But we all, every single one of us, regardless of our circumstances, has a reason to celebrate. The reason comes from the angel Gabriel. It's back in, in verse 37. You read it. For nothing is impossible with God. Verse 37. For nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that today? Amen. Do you believe that today? Amen. If you do, then we have a reason to celebrate. Yes. Because whatever you face today, nothing is impossible with God. Remember that Mary, through the good times and the bad times, continued to praise God. And with fingers of faith, she reached down and touched the face of God, even as she held this tiny baby in her arms. So as we go about our activities today, many of you have lots of plans for the day. I want you to stop and think about the great things that God has done for you. And then let your praise be rooted in that reality that God is no longer far off. But he's as close as your next breath because God came near to us, Emmanuel, God with us, and he's with us today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word today that is so true. And on this beautiful Christmas morning, we give you praise because no matter what...